Welcome back. I am Ryder Richards. This is Let's Think About It. I ended our last podcast, the one covering Timothy Snyder's Our Malady, insisting on truth in all things, which of course is what Timothy Snyder says, and I agree on principle, but then I started thinking about it, and maybe more importantly, I need to be able to figure out what the truth is before I insist we agree upon it. I mean, we can say things like, it's an objective means to understand reality, but I don't know if that actually helps very much. Because really, when I was thinking about it, some of those people storming the Capitol, they truly believed that Trump had the election stolen from him. That was their truth. And they had been primed for it when Trump kept calling the media liars you couldn't trust and then claiming there's a Democrat plot against him. And of course, there was a plot against him, but it was simply to get him out of the office. It wasn't something nefarious. And people thought, oh no, they believed they were saving democracy. They thought they had the truth. But it was so far from the truth that I held that really we're at an impasse. It's not really a matter of saying something like, we must have truth in all things. I mean, maybe that's exactly what got us here, is being really slippery with the term truth. And so in this post-truth world of alternative facts, we really need to look at how we define truth. William James says that it's a species of the good, like health. So in this podcast, we're going to be talking of the good along with the truth. Now, to do that, we're going to look at our current state of truth in society and the antimony between societal good versus individual good. Then in part two, we're going to get into some history on truth and its kind of pendulum swing between subjective and objective. And finally, we're going to take a look at how William James defines truth. Part one, grand truths. So I have smart friends who don't really believe in concepts of truth or good. And they're basically going to call you out on it if you use these terms in conversation because these terms have become subjective. And we have become, as a society, really good during our sort of post-structuralist, deconstructionist era, uh, maybe it's a sarcastic, cynical time period, of pointing out the flaws in these broad concepts of truth or good. Instead now, we champion individuals over collective identity. Oh, wait, unless that collective identity is for individuals. Mm -mm. So sure, yeah, in the end, we love humans, but we might just love individuality and personal identity even more. Let's circle around here. These big, generalized, broad brush truths or goods, they're abstractions, and they usually give way to the nuanced individual truths. My truth is not your truth. My good is not your good. And honestly, if your truth is not my truth, then is it actually truth? Well, no, not in the classical definition of being in accordance with fact or reality, because that should be objective, or at least intersubjective. So anyway, when I'm sitting around watching a show like Hot Fuzz, and I watch the town band together to win the village of the year, which means cleaning up the town image by killing hooligans and people with bad taste, or bad spelling, it's all for the greater good. And you see how when we agree upon a single vision of the good, it becomes a tribal moral imperative. It becomes a truth to uphold, and it can lead to these really bad outcomes. So your personal truth, that your village is village of the year, it ends up having disastrous impacts upon others and yourself. But in your tribe, you inoculate yourself to the pain of others, and you stick with your truth. So where this gets even stranger is when you have this grand ideology, a narrative, that must be believed in order to get people to work together as a society, because of course we're tribal. And the only thing that really lets us build massive, dense cities and have national goals and interests is, as you've all know Harari says in Sapiens, it's a shared ideology. So from the small local tribe of, we have the best village, so let's clean it up and kill the hooligans and gypsies. There are these unfortunate examples of, we have the best nation, so let's clean it up and kill all the Jews. Or, we have the best religion, let's crusade over there and save people. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Oh, wait, better yet, we can stay home and inquisition our friends and family. <sighs> so, philosophers and journalists actually worked very hard to correct this dangerous tendency of grand narratives, primarily by showing how individuals operate for their own self-interest, 
and how common sense truths become reified and weaponized, working to subjugate people. Now, psychologically, it's easier to believe stable, common sense truths rather than spend your time questioning them and fighting societal norms. It really takes a lot of cognitive energy to question everything all the time, and it loses you social status. But over time, thanks to media and academia and just culture in general, we have made a prestige game out of rethinking and deconstructing everything and proving how crappy and pointless it really is. And now, of course, we're feeling the effects of this very clever ability to pick apart previously held commonalities or truths. When all truths become small truths, these personal and local truths, they also become contingent and provisional. And the stability of the nation also becomes contingent and provisional. As Amos Burton in The Expanse says, The thing about civilization is, it keeps you civil. You get rid of one, you can't count on the other. People are tribal. The more settled things are, the bigger the tribes can be. The churn comes, and the tribes get small again. So, societally, we are in a conundrum of needing a big truth to keep the small, fractious tribes from ripping apart civilization. But we need a productive truth, not some, let's find a country of hooligans and kick their ass type of thing. Now, people are proposing this kind of unifying goal as something like fighting climate change. But really, with one-third of the global population in poverty and they're just trying to survive, it's kind of tough telling them to quit chopping down trees and feed their family so that in 50 years the air will be cleaner in Los Angeles. You see what I did there? I went from one big humanity problem to another, and then to immediate local individual problems, and then it becomes harder to argue against because you're arguing against people. So, if we don't blame or shame the family in poverty, what are we left with? Well, it's mostly activism. So we're screaming at companies and governments, we're flying people to international summits, we're making documentaries, and of course we're all applauding Greta Thunberg for shaming us. I mean, don't get me wrong, it's the right goal. But I use it as an example of preaching an obviously good idea as a unifying global narrative for over 30 years with very marginal success. So this supposedly unifying truth of fighting climate change this is supposed to be our big long-term good, but it's having difficulty competing against short-term desires, such as the personal good of the individual or the consumptive good of the global corporations. I did an art show called The Ideal back in 2015, where the premise was science and math functioned as a religion, because honestly, these truths and quantum mechanics or particle physics this is all outside of most of our realms to understand and validate the facts. Most of us can't understand the formulas, so we become reliant on others to validate and verify the math for us. Then we have to believe them. So there becomes this hand-me-down chain of trust. And of course, these truths we're supposed to be getting here, these are going to propel us into the future and save us. So in the art show, I set it up kind of like a gallery, like the Rothko Chapel, which is kind of like art plus religion, and I mixed this with a Star Trek-style spaceship bridge, where we boldly go where no man has gone before. The way into the future is trust in weird symbols and equations. It's trust in smart people with rune logic and alien ways of speaking. Mathy looking symbols are now true. It's this kind of ideal realm based on the practical, of course, but eventually it's made into the stuff of dreams and it becomes an illusion of complicit acceptance. So don't get me wrong, please, study science, go save people, put your faith in it, right? Science developed the COVID-19 vaccine, and of course your amazing cell phone. Religion and politicians, well, they didn't do that. It's better to believe in science than something like the stock market or that bald guy peddling Kool-Aid and telling you, just wait for the hellbop comet to come back around again. But equally, I think we also need to realize that this thing, science, that's showing us the way the world works through facts and empirical data and lots and lots of falsification, it may save us all, but you don't understand it, and neither do I. So we have ended up outsourcing our truth, these are our trust and beliefs, to something that we're all pretty sure will be good, or at least it's our best chance of allowing us to understand and navigate the cosmos. <laughs> Part 2. So now after planting that little seed of doubt uh, that we're outsourcing our truth, now let's get back to this idea of truth and perhaps some philosophy and history of it. 
by the way, um, skip forward about three to five minutes if you really hate Plato, Aristotle, and Kant, because this is going to be really boring for you. So I heard a YouTube video where Ray Monk gave a breakdown of the philosophy of math. But it really looked at notions of truth and objectivity, and I would hazard to say, if anything gets close to an everlasting truth describing how the world works, it's probably going to be math-related. So you all from, you know, middle school or whatever, you remember Pythagoras, A squared plus B squared equals C squared, that guy? Yeah, he had, at some point, a mystical math cult, which has, of course, always been my dream, and you should totally subscribe to the podcast so you can join my mystical math cult. Of course, in his cult, all things could be described using the ratio of whole numbers. And then he kind of accidentally discovered that a triangle that has a hypotenuse of the square root of 2, which is an irrational number, and this means that arithmetic is no longer logical. And so you can't build your cult on it, so they had to keep everyone quiet. Of course, the Greeks said, well, if arithmetic can't be trusted then let's just go ahead and say geometry is the perfect thing, because the triangle itself can't lead you astray. It's just the formula, it's just the arithmetic that does that. And then we get into this odd realm of what actually is a number anyway? It isn't necessarily an object you can touch or feel, but it seems to be objective because we can all agree on it and it describes how the world works. But it's not like other objects out there in the world. So Plato develops this realm of forms, where these abstract, perfect, unchanging, absolute, eternal geometries can exist. And he declares, our world is merely a shadow of this more perfect world. (laughs) So you can see how problems start. There is this perfect place, a transcendent other realm. And this one, meanwhile, is quite imperfect. (laughs) And the way we understand this perfect place is by reason or logic. So thinking leads us closer to the absolute truth. This is a different and better place, and hmm, weird, it sounds kind of like heaven, right? But in Platonic land, your trees, of course, would have to be shaped like lollipops, and your rocks would probably end up looking like Platonic solids. Well, Aristotle, he came along and he disagreed. He said, no, 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 that's stupid. Geometry and numbers didn't come first. They aren't transcendent. We simply applied numbers to things. There's four sheep over there. We applied four to the sheep. That's a property we apply to describe the world. Quit out with all this platonic idealism shit. (laughs) So the problem, of course, with this is uh, another guy, Frege. He says, if we are somehow the filter for how we apply logic and math, then truth, this objective, absolute truth, has unfortunately, once again, become subjective. So what we can do is we can declare, there's three ewes and one ram, instead of four sheep. And this way we determine how the math is applied. But anyway, let's skip forward until like the 1790s, where Kant, in an interesting way, uses math and logic to formulate transcendental idealism, and these kind of notions of truth. And I don't want to bore you here, but let's just look at how we broke things into categories and how this influenced so much after that. Analytical propositions and synthetic propositions. Analytical statements are by definition true. All bachelors are male. Now a synthetic statement, it's where you pair up things and you can say, all bachelors are stinky. Ah, And the synthetic statement, it's two different categories and they probably aren't true even though so far as you know, every bachelor you've met does in fact stink. So Kant also generates this other way of knowing things. It's a priori and a posteriori. Basically, you have prior knowledge, a priori, and a knowledge of buts. Wait, no, maybe that's just a knowledge after the fact. Yeah, so it's uh, prior, before, posteriori is after. So a priori knowledge, it's something you can figure out while sitting on your couch. It's theoretical. So I can understand just when you say bachelor, I know that they're male and unmarried and they probably have a butt. Now, a posteriori, that is, after meeting the bachelor, yes, indeed, I have done my empirical butt-sniffing research, and yes, his posterior does indeed stink. Of course, you can go out and you can sniff a lot more butts, and you can gather a lot of experiential evidence, and you can deduce that, hmm, not all, but most bachelors are stinky. So what would happen here is you kind of would think something like these uh, analytical propositions, the ones you can sit on your couch and make these tautologies where they're necessarily true, that this would go with a priori because something is true prior to you having to encounter it. 
Now, synthetic propositions, they're pulling from two categories, such as bachelors and stink. This would seem to go more along the lines of a posteriori, things you have to experience to be true. But math is kind of odd. Being that it's necessarily true, it's true of the world. So when you say something like 2 plus 5 equals 7, that's true of the world. But it's not an analytical statement. It's a synthetic statement. Normally, this would mean it's a posteriori, yet for some reason you can sit on your couch and figure it out, so it's a priori. So it is a synthetic a priori, which is just weird. And it led Kant to develop transcendental idealism, where we can't know things in themselves, nomina. We can only know phenomena, things as they appear to us. So thus, it's about appearances, and they have been filtered, and math is one of the filters. So... We go through all this work, right? And we're back to this idea of truth being a subjective truth. I mean, sure, we can all agree on it, but guys like Frege and Russell, they tried their darndest to go back to this idea of Plato to make math or something like it an objective truth again. There has to be an objective truth out there. Now, the reason I find all this important to understand truth, because we're witnessing all these philosophers, we're witnessing all these people, they're staking out positions. This is the truth. It's absolute and objective. No, 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 it's not. It is applied to the world by people. Nope, it's truth, objective. Jeez, oh, it's exhausting. This little pendulum swing keeps going back and forth. But next, what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at William James' pragmatism and see how he handles truth. Part 3. Pragmatism. One fascinating aspect of the truth that we should keep in mind is almost no one cares what Kant, Plato, or Aristotle say about anything. Truth is built mostly on consensus and intersubjectivity, which is really when we have kind of a shared set of truths between two or more minds. It's when our subjective beliefs overlap into a shared reality. So this moves us from this notion of truth revealing how the world really works, kind of a foundational principle in agreement with reality, and it opens it up to a popularity contest. So one way to find out what society actually takes for granted and what it totally believes in, the kind of operational truth on the ground, is that no one argues about math. If you buy two juices with only 1% juice in them and you pay $2 per juice, well, you may argue about the right of the government to tax you based on juice content. Yeah, but no one is questioning the math of $2 plus $2 equals $4 plus tax, and you can argue that tax part. People only argue about things that are unverifiable, things that are arguable. That makes sense, right? No one argues basic math. But they will claim that their capital G God is the capital T truth, and they'll argue about that all day. But if it was literally, definitionally true, there would be nothing to argue about. Inconceivable! I do not think that's what it means, what you think it means. Yet, this has a precedent. Plato invented this realm of the absolute with perfect forms. And over time, this attempt to prove an absolute realm as this source of truth, it occupied and warped some of the most brilliant thinkers in the world, especially when it ended up getting conflated with God and religion. Just look at Hegel trying so hard to prove the all-knowing absolute was not a contradiction that he came up with this idea of negation where a thing both was itself and its opposite. So relation by its negation or nothing of itself completed it I, I mean what the hell i i don't even understand it but it sounds super smart and it's also maybe super crazy nonsense there was a camp of academic philosophers in the 1800s who pushed rationalism as this kind of need to prove that there was this absolute an all-knower or basically some version of another realm that was in some way perhaps unknowable to us but still it was a source of and we're all linked to it, or we come from it, or we're part of it, or something. Now, this is all fairly romantic, and it's quite an elegant idea. And you can still find it at work in things like science and math as we're looking for universal theories. Now, William James, in the early 1900s and late 1890s, he pushed back against this camp. He was a pragmatist, and he leaned more into empiricism. So when speaking of the absolute or religious experience... He definitely didn't deny it existed. He instead offered kind of a metaphor for what it actually does, how it works in reality. He said that it was as if we were a fish in water, nurtured by the air above, yet could not breathe it pure. We could, however, swim up to the surface and get energized by it. 
which would redirect our energies. So the great work of the absolute, the unknowable, it's really to redirect us. Now this kind of thing, this kind of metaphor, it's very typical of James and pragmatism. He was always trying to find a middle ground, but he wanted to focus on what actually works and what its outcomes would be in our daily lives. This is kind of a populist, man of the people type of thing, right? I mean, what good is ivory tower philosophy when it can't be instrumentalized? I mean, for most people, what good is Heidegger? When getting to the truth is that complicated, we really might need to employ Occam's razor or just cut the Gordian knot. We might need to simplify things instead of wasting our time. Because at what point have we just descended into vicious intellectualism? Now, we all already believe that we have a handle on the truth. So we could basically bypass philosophy anyway. I mean, I've made it this far, I'm doing fine. But, of course, we all come laden with a lot of common sense truths. This is baggage, because most of them aren't actually true. Now, these are handed off to us by parents and society, and we never really question them. But over time, we as people, we're capable of growing, and we can add new truths. We can carve ourselves up into who we need to be. We can carve out the marble block. James says this is also a process of grafting new truths onto our existing beliefs. We assimilate them by rationalizing them. Of course, really, our brains are reluctant to do this as it changes our worldview, but it's necessary to grow. Now, James was also a psychologist, and he says truth is part of a thought pattern. That pattern must be validated and verifiable. And the big one here, it's how you get to validated and verifiable. You must put it up for scrutiny. James says, Truth happens to an idea. It becomes true, is made true by events. Its verity is, in fact, an event, a process. The process, namely, of its verifying itself, its verification. Its validity is the process of its validation. So let's look at this. Truth. One, must be a fact. Two, must have relations to provable ideas, such as math. And three, it must prove useful to our reality and lead to useful consequences. So my truth of, say, believing in aliens because I grew up in Roswell, so I have a right to believe in aliens. Um, well, let's look at this real quick. How about number one? How about facts? Well, there are some that I can't explain. I can't explain things such as UFOs. So I have to ask if those facts relate to math or provable ideas. And they seem to, especially if the gravitational drives that Bob Lazar discusses become functional, then we might actually know that for a fact. And then I really also have to ask myself if my belief in aliens leads to useful consequences. Well, yeah, right now, no. No, it might not. Uh, but then again, it might someday. So I have to stay open to that idea. And really, William James is down with that. He's always wanting us to be non-dogmatic and fallibilist. So the problem with aliens is that it isn't really validated or verifiable right now. And of course, it's under scrutiny, but uh, there's just not enough validation to let it really be useful to me. So while your ideas must work in reality, you don't get to make up your own truths, right? Flat earthers, yeah, I'm looking at you, buddy. Your ideas must be practical, useful, and have utility in the world. And this is key. These ideas you hold, even if they're not useful, and they may not be immediately harmful to you, but also, they're not of the good. James says truths are good, because we can ride them into the future without being unpleasantly surprised. I kind of like that. It's almost like truth is an old steady mare or something rather than a young bunking bronco or a colt. Now, as James says, the benefit of truce is they lead us into useful verbal and conceptual quarters, as well as directly up to useful sensible termini. They lead to consistency, stability, and flowing human intercourse. They lead away from eccentricity and isolation from foiled and barren thinking. Oh geez, well yeah, that strikes home. Of course, because now we're in a time of eccentricity and isolation, and there's also a lack of stability in human discourse, and I don't see most of it leading to any sensible termini. I mean, different portions of our country hold vastly different views, verified by tribal consensus and inner subjectivity. The notion I really want to take from James is to be open to truths changing, while still looking for validation, verification, and scrutiny. I don't want the first without the second. I want useful communication away from foiled or barren thinking. If 
as James says, truths are of the good, then why do we work so hard not to verify our own truths? All right, thanks for sticking with me on that. I know we didn't really narrow down what exactly the truth is, even though we talked about it a lot, but we did get to a practical framework from which you can validate your beliefs, ask if they relate to provable ideas, and have useful consequences. If you got something out of this, please take a moment to rate and review the podcast on whatever platform you use. All the best, and until next time, stay safe.